Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This week you're doing something slightly different. I'm going to be reading the latest medical AI research papers and reacting to them, just sharing a few thoughts as I go along. This is something that I was planning to do anyway, but then I thought why not record it, talk about it out loud, and maybe someone out there might find it interesting. There's definitely a chance that not many people are gonna watch this video, but that's fine. And this was in part inspired by a video by Daniel Burke, uh, which I'll link in the description, where essentially he went through the state of AI reports um, that was published last year and talked about the different things that were commented on in that report. So what I'm going to be using today is something called Dr. Penguin, which if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's essentially um, some researchers, I think based out of Stanford, or it's a collaboration between a few different people doing research in, in applying AI to healthcare. They collate the most interesting medical AI papers of that week and they send it out as a short email. So I'm subscribed to this and I get this every week and I don't always read it during the week so then I like to go back and review it. Uh, so what I'm going to do probably for the next half an hour or so is go through this weekly, um, go through these weekly emails where they outline some of the studies from the week. I'm going to then pick out the ones that are interesting, uh, interesting to me or the ones that I would like to read a little bit more about briefly overview those papers, make a few comments if something comes to mind. Um, and I will probably do this for around half an hour. Uh, we'll see. Um, okay, so, and we'll see, I'm gonna start with this most recent weekly summary uh, and then I'll work backwards. So if there's still more time, I'll just keep working backwards uh, through this. So let's begin. Uh, we have here, this is a week commencing 13th of January. Um, and they're talking about a few different papers. So let's, I'm actually going to open it, open it up in a separate page here before. And they've picked these five papers. So a CNN, which is a convolutional neural network, um, which is a neural network spe specifically good at looking at images. Raman histology image. I'm not too sure what Raman histology is. Predict brain and tumor diagnosis in the operating room in under 150 seconds. Uh, deep learning to predict OCT. Uh, so diabetic edema. So there's a lot of interesting things going on with using AI to analyze images of, of retinas, um, which can be photographs or it can be scans of the retina. So OCT is a common type of retinal scan. Uh, hierarchical statistical mechanical modeling. Okay, so peptide binding to mines. So this is looking at protein interactions. Um, so that's something I know a little bit less about um, because it's one step removed from the clinical context. The side compared machine learning approaches traditional logistic regression, predicting key outcomes in heart failure. Okay, so this is more of a kind of predictive model. Um, using logistic regression. Or it's comparing it to logistic regression. So, yeah, uh, we we'll, might have a look at that in a moment. Discuss challenges to the in clinical settings. Okay, so this is more like an opinion piece, and they have the abstracts here. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the abstracts, talk about anything that's particularly interesting, uh, and then for some of the papers I'll check if they are available. I think for some of them they're going to be firewalled in which case I probably can't use my institutional access to show it because then I'll be putting it in the public domain. Uh, but the ones that I can read, I will be reading. Um, and uh, you guys can can see those as well, of course. Fine, so this uh, brain tumor one, let's have a look. Essential for finding safety. I'm contracting. Yeah, so interpretation of intraoperative histolo histologic images. So I think that this is where uh, you take a um, you take a histo histology sample. So you take a sample of tissue while you're doing the operation, and then you analyze it, and that then feeds uh, a decision made in the operating theater once that result is back. So brain, predict brain tumor diagnosis in the operating room in under 150 seconds. Yeah, and so obviously the main restriction here when you have this kind of uh, approach is the um, is the time that it takes because you're in an operating operating theatre. Every extra minute carries extra risk. So if you're able to 
speed up that process in some way, then that can be very useful. And in general, that's something that AI is pretty good at. I don't know why I keep looking over at the microphone here. Um, in general, AI, that's something that AI is pretty good at is uh, being much quicker than humans at processing it. So the next question is then, is it going to be accurate enough to then be used? Because if it's on comparable accuracy to a human diagnosis, or if it's better, then fantastic. But if it's uncomparable, then it has that speed savings and there's a strong argument there that that could be something that's useful. So they did a prospective clinical trial, which is also interesting because there's not been a huge number of prospective clinical trials. And uh, that's one of the main criticisms, I think, one of the main fair criticisms of AI applied to healthcare is that there's not a lot of prospective clinical trials. There's a lot of retrospective trials but the expectation is that when you go from a retrospective trial to a prospective trial, there's usually a drop off in performance. So it's great if you have an amazing um, retrospective performance, but you really have to, the proof is in the prospective clinical trial showing that, the, that it is effective. So here, prospective, um, if there's anybody who's not familiar, like so retrospective is basically just looking um, backwards in time perspective is where you go with the study forward. So retrospective, you have some data that's been collected already and you look at it. Perspective is where you decide at one point in time, you're going to start collecting data and analyzing that data. Um, so you're kind of going along with it and uh, it's a little bit more kind of real world. Um, and also you have randomized control trials, which is where you actively change a component of it. So maybe you have one diagnostic pathway that's using the pathologist analyzing the histology images, one that is having the human analyzing it, and you compare the performance between the two. Um, or there's other ways that you can try and combine AI with a human, with a medical um, examiner, uh, with, a, with a pathologist kind of analyzing those images. Um, such as using them in parallel, that sort of thing. Okay, anyway, I, th I feel like I'm going pretty slowly here, so let's uh, crack on. Uh, we demonstrate the scene boy. It was non-inferior, okay. So the accuracy is, is comparable. It's not better, it's not worse. But So the main argument is the speed advantage. You need to classify the major. So Spanning segmentation uh, to identify tumor infiltrated diagnostic regions within SRH. What was SRH? Okay, that's a specific type of histology slide. Okay, yeah. So that's that's a fair argument. Um, you know, if it, if this is if this is quick, you can make a, an argument that this could be useful in uh, speeding up that process during operations. And I imagine it will be the case that initially that will get implemented alongside a histologist, uh, histo histologist pathologist, and they will just make sure that it is agreeing with the decision. Or maybe that's actually what they did in this study. To be honest, um, I don't. Does it say that they uh, separated it or they did it kind of at the same time together? I'm not too sure. Let's see if we can access this paper. It's in Nature Medicine though, so I imagine we won't be able to. No, fine. Okay, but that's interesting. That's very interesting. Okay, next paper. Nature Communications. So OCT derived diabetic macular edema grades from fundus photo photographs. Oh, fo uh, fundus photographs. So macular edema causes visual loss, yes, and they want to train a deep learning model to detect it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and their model did pretty well, particularly it was specificity was much better and had good AUC scores. Uh, if you're not familiar, AUC scores um, in fact, I'm not going to explain them now, but I will put some links. I'll put some good links in the description. Okay, fine. So essentially, this is again looking at a very specific task um, of detecting macular edema and showing that this AI model is able to do that at a level that is pretty comparable with uh, retinal specialists. And actually is, it's more specific. Um, let's see if I can access this paper. It's nature, oh, so we can access this. So I'm not gonna read the full paper, <laughs> um, but I will skim it. It looks like this is from Google. 
Uh, yeah, this is Google Health. And I'm just going to skim it, see, see what the key points are. Okay. So you can predict the features from photographs. Ah, okay, so this is very interesting. So they're taking, because this is an interesting problem in machine learning at the moment, um, and there's been some very interesting papers just in computer vision more generally of basically taking a 2D image and trying to convert it into a 3D image because that's something obviously that could be revolutionary within medicine if we're able to reliably take a 2D image, in this case, a photograph of a retina and turn that into a 3D image, um, then that's amazing. Um, I also heard today about, I think a research group trying to do this with x-rays of teeth. Um, so if you can have a sideways dental x-ray and a, a frontal dental x-ray, or, or maybe kind of, I think actually from the bottom up, if you can use that two 2D images to create a 3D image, that's something that can be very useful. Okay. Okay, I don't wanna to get too bogged down in this paper, but again, that, that's very interesting um, application because obviously if you can uh, extrapolate from a 2D image to a 3D image with a reasonable reliability, then it makes it much, much more accessible because a 2D, a retinal photograph can be taken by anybody in the world on a smartphone, theoretically. I mean, there are considerations such as sometimes you need to dilate the eyes or put in particular kind of eye drops, but to some extent, Anybody with a with a smartphone or anybody with a with a camera of some sort can take a, a picture of the retina, whereas for an OCT scan, which is the 3D image of the of the retina, you would you need specialist equipment. So this is something that could uh, scale to having impact in the third world. And I imagine they probably commented on that in the discussion. Um, okay, let's go on to the next paper. So this is another, pro oh, this is the protein peptide bonding. This is probably gonna go over my head. Uh, yeah, that doesn't mean a huge amount to me. Predicting bonding. So, okay, predicting interactions and, and kind of signaling networks. So predicting heart failure outcomes. Okay, so the, this is uh, an interesting approach and well, this is an interesting clinical problem. So this is from using data from Boston. So limited improvements over traditional logistic regression in predicting heart failure outcomes. Yeah, so basically the idea with these kinds of studies, there's, there's a lot of studies like this um, coming out over the last few years where essentially there's a model that exists for um, predicting outcomes, uh, such as this, in this case, it's a logistic regression. And what these models do is they take in multiple different variables, feed those through a kind of pattern of um, calculations and then give an output, such as the percentage that they think will progress um, at a rapid rate or those that will progress at a more moderate rate or maybe how long they think the patient um, is going to live with heart failure. Um, and th th those are the traditional approaches. There's been various different statistical methods that have been around for hundreds of years. The main advantage that AI and machine learning can have on that is that you can analyze greater, num greater volumes of data, greater numbers of variables, and just identify more complicated relationships. So here they've used uh, random forest, gradient boosted modeling, um, to essentially, what I imagine without looking at the paper, they will have just looked at a lot more uh, variables. Does it say how many they've used? So they'll use a lot more variables. They'll have fed it into these models, uh, which are um, can be used both for classification and regression tasks, and use that to try and predict how long, what have they tried to predict? So predicting mortality, predicting hospitalization, and home time, home time loss. I'm not sure what home time loss is. And found that there's a, there's a marginal improvement. So it's essentially it's a case of taking a existing statistical technique, using a machine learning approach, which has a slight improvement on those techniques, and then just slightly improving that model. Um, so it's more of an incremental gain rather than a um, you know, an exponential an exponential improvement, an exponential step, but definitely very interesting uh, and 
useful as well. And then this looks more like a commentary article. So challenges to reproducibility of machine animals in healthcare. Let's see if we can access this. It's in JAMA. We probably, oh, we can. Okay, great. And this is Andrew Beam, I recognize that name. Uh, where are these? So this, okay, this is a collaboration between Canada and uh, Boston, Harvard, Harvard uh, Medical School. So, okay, let's have a look what they're saying. So, challenges to reproduce, uh, challenges to reproducibility of machine learning models in healthcare, which is a key challenge, as they said. Concerns, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a key thing actually, is this idea of of reproducibility um, from the point of view of, of data and code, because one of the issues with machine learning models is it's very dependent on the data uh, in order to train it. That's, that's paramount in being able to train a machine learning model. Um, and then also there's discussions about the code as well. So in terms of the, yeah, the data, so you can have, let's say one hospital has a data set um, of a thousand CT scans and they want to, uh, to train this model, then it's hard, you can't reproduce that identically because you're gonna be using slightly different data. So if another hospital has another thousand CT scans and then they kind of replicate that, then they will use it using their data set and then there's gonna be slight differences in performance. So the, the question there is how do you prove that the uh, model is generalizable and is there some sort of difference between the data sets that means that it performs less well in this one that tried to repeat it. Uh, one thing that can solve that is publicly available data sets and there are various different publicly available data sets for different types of problems. And then the second issue here, we're talking about code. There's always a trade-off in terms of um, giving your code, uh, making your code publicly available so people can analyze the code and then can use that to reproduce your model versus the fact that some of the people who are going to be creating these models and code, uh, they might want to use that in a product, they might want to use that um, in some sort of way that they're going to be getting a financial return on, uh, which is which motivated the underlying research. And in that case, it's difficult to make the argument that they should be fully sharing all of their code because then that's going to inhibit the um, extent to which they're happy to be doing the, making the models themselves or whether it's financially feasible and that sort of thing. So um, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of sharing at least some of the code that you use to develop your model um, because obviously we want to be practicing evidence-based uh, medicine, and so we want to be able to reproduce the studies before they become widely implemented. Does that imply that study is correct? It was able to be verified. Yeah. Yeah. So these are all, these are not specific to machine learning. Confounding, obviously you can always have confounding factors, multiple hypothesis testing, um, randomness enhanced analysis procedure. Access. Yeah, so this is, I think for me in machine learning, this is probably the main challenge is this uh, access to data and code that it can be difficult to try and re recreate certain studies as I've just explained. Yeah, and obviously data is particularly important in healthcare, particularly, particularly private in healthcare. Mm, yeah, this is a key point because you want a model that does generalize to different populations in different places because that's actually how it's going to be useful. So it needs to be robust to that. Okay, unique challenges, let's speed up a little bit. Okay, explaining how machine learning works. Hmm. Fine, going a bit into the, um, a bit more about the approaches for machine learning. Process for increasing reducibility. So let's see, what do they suggest?
open data and data code and results. Yeah, so tripod and console and uh, these are basically reporting guidelines. The, the, the people who created these have actually recently created updated versions. Ah, yes, see, we've now been adapted. So you now have, I think it's called like tripod AI and console ML, or maybe it's console AI and tripod ML. Um, but essentially, these are guidelines and recommendations on how to uh, incorporate those into your um, when you're when you're publishing machine learning research applied to healthcare. Those are some kind of guidelines on how you should do that in a way that prevents bias or reduces the risk of bias um, and ensures that you're reporting in a way that's um, that's most scientifically rigorous. Yeah, and this is a key point here, improves patient outcomes, because it's easy to show that you have a good accuracy or a good AUC score, but actually the true test is when that's implemented clinically, does that improve outcomes? There's no substitute for uh, randomized clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if that's because I read it too quickly, but I didn't see a lot of Kind of concrete discussion of the ways in which we can increase reducibility. Uh, that we can increase reducibility. Uh, I guess okay in terms of yeah yeah just adhering to good scientific practice essentially is the main thing. Fine. Uh, no, that's 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 an excellent article. Very good points. Um, some other interesting points here. Go off. Okay. Okay. So that's this week. That's the uh, the most recent week of Dr. Penguin. I'm now going to. And how, how long have we been going for? It's like 10, 15 minutes. Let's go into the previous week. So this is the final week of 2019. Okay, so three papers, a bit of a short week. I guess people were having a Christmas break. Very understandable. Section of anemia. Ah, okay, interesting. So this is an example of Detecting things that humans are unable to do. Uh, this is an example of augmenting our abilities. Um, because to my knowledge, when you look at a retina for a human, we're not able to, to tell if someone is anemic or not. I mean, maybe we are. This could be my ignorance. Yeah, to my knowledge, um, a retinal specialist looking at a retinal image would not know how to detect anemia um, as far as I'm aware. So what's very, for me, super interesting about some of the AI applied to um, images or, or just gen generally about AI, I guess, applied to, to healthcare is when it can detect something extra on top of what we would be able to detect. Um, and the first example that I was aware of this, which is, super interesting is that you can tell someone's gender uh, from looking at their retinal image. Um, this is this was published a year or two ago uh, and essentially that's not something that humans are able to do and I don't know what the latest is in terms of then interrogating this algorithm to see what are the features that they're using to be able to distinguish between it. It's probably something that's quite subtle and spread, spread out maybe throughout the image uh, and this could be another example of that. But obviously this is a bit more of a, of a useful example because you can actually, I assume if you take a, a picture of someone's retina, you'll be able to tell what gender they are. Uh, in this case, you know, we're, we're doing something that you wouldn't be able to test otherwise except by a clinical examination or, or a blood test. So um, that could be very useful. And again, we, there's a lot of stuff going on with retinal scans as we saw in the previous week. There's a lot of potential for this to be used to um, make increase accessibility uh, in countries where they don't have a lot of access to healthcare. If you're able to get this kind of information from a retinal image, then that can be very useful. And it looks like this, I think, is also from Google Health. Um, at least I recognize some of those authors as being from Google Health. Okay, normal machine learning based approach for IPS progenitor cell identification. So IPS induced pluripotent cell, um, this, this is these, uh, basically generated stem cell cells, Yamanaka uh, won a Nobel Prize because he showed that you can give transcription factors and that will convert um, a cell back into a, a stem cell. Um, and so this is for identifying their progenitor. 
detection of induced pluripotent stem cell progenitor cells. Um, okay, again, this is outside my area of expertise because it's one step removed from clinical practice. What are they saying? It's difficult to identify experimentally. Okay. Yeah, that's going over my head. Um, <laughs> okay, and then uh, AI improves kidney care in nature reviews to follow you. Let's see if we can access this. This looks like a kind of viewpoint commentary. No, we can't access this. Uh, so what does it say? So EHR, physiological signals, kidney imaging, digitized biopsy specimens. So for example, Google Health have created a model to predict kidney disease, to predict AKIs in a clinical setting, uh, which was published in Nature last year. I think it was in July, 2019. So this is probably a commentary on that, and there may well be other research in the area. Um, I'm not aware of research looking at AKIs, there may well be, uh, which is an interesting point in itself because I read something where, somewhere recently about how um, there's a bit of a bias in terms of everyone is aware of all the research that Google is doing and less so um, people, yeah, less so research outside of Google um, because they just get, they get a lot of media attention. Okay, so previous week, the week running up to Christmas. A few more papers. <clears throat> uh, this is going over my head. Small molecule retention time. I probably won't read that one. Deep autoencoders and non-hierarchical collectors to extract small set of features from histopathological images and show prediction accuracy of prostate cancer recurrence, highland humans. In fact, actually, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read through the. No, 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 it's actually, it's, it's useful to read these ones first. So CNN, mammographic screening images, I'm about to sneeze. Okay, so they built a CNN based on mammography images to predict the risk of future breast cancer. So I'm interested to see how that works, whether that's detecting some sort of um, lesion, like a precancerous lesion on the mammogram, or if it's just detecting something in the breast that suggests that it might develop cancer. Enhancing lesions on MRI scans obtained without contrast. Okay. So this is, that's interesting because if you can detect a lesion uh, without contrast using AI, then do you need to use contrast and the associated risks of injecting someone with contrast? So predicting MI and cardiac death based on imaging based variables. So again, I'm curious what uh, variables those are. Wang et al. talking about interpreting air models. I suspect this may be the same Wang who did a lot of interesting work on um, colonoscopy uh, polyp detection. A couple of really interesting papers, uh, if you're interested, is by a group from Wang et al. It's not necessarily the same Wang et al. We might see in a second uh, looking at polyps. Um, I think they did, the, to my knowledge, the first prospective clinical trial of using AI in healthcare. And then another viewpoint about responsible development, implementation, etc. Okay, so I'm going to skip this one because that's over my head. Explainable knowledge from unannotated histopathology images. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, interesting. So one of the steps when you have a histology slide, um, which you're taking a slice of, of some tissue, you're looking at it on a slide, uh, a key step often in developing a machine learning model is that you will identify features on that slide. So simplistically, that might be, uh, let's say the number of, or look at the, the nuclei, the size of the nuclei, some of the, the features, the um, thickness of the nuclear membrane, the surface area of the nuclei, some of the other um, kind of intracellular components, see if they are visible and their features. And typically, traditionally it's always been done manually uh, where someone has kind of outlined and labeled those. And sometimes that information will be feed in, fed into training a machine learning model. Um, so for example, there is a data set on Kaggle, which is of breast cancer uh, of breast cancer features where there's been a histopathology slides have been taken they've been manually annotated by humans and then using those features you can train a machine learning model so then when you get a new histopathology image you look at it on a slide you can then manually segment it by humans look at outline the nucleus measure the nuclear membrane thickness etc and then feed that into your model which knows how to recognize those uh, this is a different approach versus the CNN approach, the convolutional neural network approach, which is where it actually looks at the image itself and identifies those features itself and then uses those to create a model that predicts uh, one way or the other. What they've done here is they've used deep learning. So they've used a CNN um, to basically automate that annotation process. So I imagine they are annotating features of these cells, such as the size of the nucleus and maybe the thickness and um, I'm not too sure the different variables that they like to look at uh, and using that in the context of prostate cancer and trying to predict the recurrence based on these features that were generated by algorithms rather than generated by humans and comparing that with the diagnosis of pathologists. Ah, okay, so again, coming back to this identifying things that humans didn't. Um, which is what's exciting about AI, in, in my opinion, one of the main things. So they found some features that were not recognized by um, histopathologists, which can be interesting because if the if these are features that maybe we typically didn't used to look at and the AI recognizes that that has a predictive capacity, then going forward that can improve human performance because we now know about that and then we can start looking at those on slides, potentially. Okay, great. Deep learning risk score uh, and standard mammographic density score for breast cancer risk prediction. So they want to take in more information. What information do they want to take in? A risk score that is associated with future breast cancer, compare it. Um, so what did they use? They used the deep learning risk score. Percentage density. So these are, these are separate things. The dense area and the percentage de density are not being calculated by the deep learning model from the looks of it. Well, higher among women diagnosed with breast cancer than those without breast cancer diagnosis. The dense area and the percentage density. So these are the two kind of key predictive features. But how are they being identified? So are they being identified by the deep learning model? I think that's what they're saying. Without going more into this, I think they're saying by using deep learning, they are an assessing how dense it is and the percent, the, the area of density and the percentage of density. And those are predictive of uh, breast cancer at a level that's higher Well, it says more accurately, more accurately than who? Are we, are we saying, is this a compared to doctors? Or is this a compared to existing approaches? It might be compared to existing models. In fact, I think they said it's compared to logistic regression, if I remember correctly. Yeah, logistic regression models. So basically it's an improvement on the model. Again, it's, it's an example of a paper where we're taking an existing model and we're, we're stepping it up using AI.
predicting enhancing lesions in MS from non-contrast. So this is predicting those with, uh, that will enhance with contrast without giving the contrast. Mm -hmm. See, I like, I like the structure of this one. This one, it's less structured. Background purpose. Mets and Mets. Okay, perspective analysis of existing MRI data. Fivefold cross validation, and they looked at the AUC. So, of the thousand people, five hundred had a contrast enhancing lesion. And there were pretty good AUCs, 0.82 and 0.75 for predicting, based on whether it was slice-wise or participant-wise. Uh, I think what they're saying here is that in a particular, if it looks at a particular slice, it can get it with 0.82, as it looks at the patient on the whole, it gets 0.75, I think. Okay, it's interesting. And so here, did they... Uh, did they do both scans with contrast and without contrast? Maybe they said that, maybe I skipped that over. So they did it on post contrast. Yeah, so I imagine that's what they will have done. They will have done the contrast image and the post contrast. And then you have the ground truth, um, which is the, the, the objective real results. And then you can look at the con uh, non contrast, which probably is like a pre contrast scan and just see if the model can predict it, you don't show the pre-contrast scan to the model. Uh, sorry, you do show the pre-contrast scan to the model. You don't show the model with contrast and you see if it gets those models correct. Uh, so I've still got a few more studies on this one and I'll probably wrap up actually after this, uh, after these few. So predicting long-term risk of MI and cardiac death based on clinical risk, calcium and adipose tissue. So we're looking at a few different variables here. Coronary artery calcium, ad, uh, adipose tissue to predict long-term risk. So it's another perspective trial, which makes it more interesting. Extreme gradient boosting. Okay, so they had a decent number of, of actual cardiac events because one of the issues with these kind of uh, studies is this is machine learning or otherwise, you need to have enough events to analyze for it to actually be useful. So 76 is a pretty reasonable number. Okay, so CAC score. So as I understand the CAC, the coronary artery calcium score is something that's currently used to predict risk of MI um, going forward. So it looks like here they basically took that plus adipose tissue, which I'm not sure if that's currently used to predict um, MI. By combining those, they saw an improvement. And they looked at other factors as well. So blood pressure and cholesterol. Blood pressure was more important than cholesterol in women and opposite in men. So it's reversed. Okay, so... Again, another application where you improve on existing predictive models with ML, which uh, there's gonna be a lot of this, I think, because this is less, to some extent, this is less dependent on new and interesting novel forms of data. Uh, obviously, you do need the data to train the models, but if, the, if we have two different risk scores that are already being kind of measured um, and calculated, then by combining them and using machine learning, we can improve them. Uh, and uh, with electronic health record data, as we have more things like blood tests and clinical coding of comorbidities and uh, the features of the relevant features of individual patients, then it just creates a lot of potential for anybody in a hospital anywhere around the world, uh, if they understand ML, to get involved in these kind of projects and create some improved risk model. Um, yeah, and I think, I actually think that 
Um, the, the barrier to entry to this is lower than what a lot of people think. I think when you hear about machine learning AI, it's easy to be put off and think that uh, this is something that's out of reach for the average person, uh, or, or sorry, for the average researcher, for the average doctor working in a hospital. Actually, not necessarily. Um, a lot of the, the machine learning algorithms, you don't need to, you, I guess if you're if you're the if you're the doctor, you don't necessarily need to have a deep insight into the algorithms as long as there's someone else that you're collaborating with who does. So typically, uh, it will be a collaboration between someone from a clinical background, uh, someone with a machine learning background, maybe computer science. It's often useful useful to have a statistician as well um, because so much of this relies on statistics when you're building these kind of models. So those are the yeah. I would just say. Uh, if, if you are watching this and you are a researcher, an academic, and you're in thinking about incorporating machine learning and maybe there's a model that you see could be improved with machine learning, definitely it's worth investing a bit of time just to um, try developing that and reaching out to people because there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of uh, kind of low-hanging fruits, you could say, because these model, the, the techniques machine learning have been around for a relatively short period of time. And there's a lot of clinical problems that have not yet been solved using these and a lot of models that haven't really been updated yet with machine learning as we're seeing here. Uh, these are all getting published in pretty high impact journals. And essentially they're taking an existing model and improving it with machine learning. So there's, there's, we're gonna see a lot of this for, for several years to come. Okay, next an article in Annals of Internal Medicine, should healthcare accept black body medicine? So I've actually already read this paper. Um, shall I? Yes, let's, let's see if we can access it. Yeah, essentially issue a black box. You may well only be aware of this, uh, but with deep learning, the weights are updated kind of inside the model and it learns to pick up the relevant features, but it's not always clear uh, exactly how the model is working and what it's giving weight to because the there's many layers and um, you can't see directly what value is associated with what input necessarily. Uh, which is one of the reasons why they're pretty effective, but it's an issue when it comes to interpretability uh, and trying to explain how the algorithm works. There's associated risks with it, which I'm sure they talk about in this article. Do I get the full text? No, not without a subscription. Um, yeah, and I think that th this is an issue. So often it, we can get good degrees of accuracy uh, for diagnosis and prediction using these models, but we want to we want to understand how they work as best as we can. Uh, one area of progress has been made in this is uh, kind of with heat maps when you look at um, CNNs for analyzing images. So, for example, uh, if I bring up the Stanford um, uh, ChexNet paper, is it Chex? And if I find their, their performance, so in this paper, which was published a few years back, as one part of it, they analyze, essentially they give you these heat maps within the image of the area that the machine learning model is looking at and using to uh, come to the diagnosis that it, that it has come to. And that's, that's cool. Uh, that's helpful because then that explains uh, exactly, you know, what's, what's actually happening uh, when, when the model's analyzing it, where is it looking at to distinguish between one category and another. Um, and there's also, there's an excellent blog post from uh, someone called Luke Oakton Raider um, on interpretability. Uh, it might be this article. I'm not going to read it now, but yeah, this is it. So this is an excellent article. I mean, basically the two things we're talking about when we talk about explainability is what is it looking at, uh, what, like where is it looking, and what is it in that area that it's looking at. 
Um, and when you see a radiology report, that's typically what they do. They will comment on, uh, we see an irregular mass in the upper outer quadrants, and this is in keeping with malignancy. So then the interpretation is the next step. And ultimately, if we can develop AIs uh, that can come up with this, that can look at the feature, uh, say what it is, say where it is, um, and then perhaps an interpretation on top of that, then that's a pretty good benchmark for explainability because essentially when a scan happens and it gets sent off to the, off to the radiologist, that's what the radiologist is doing primarily, uh, is those two steps. Okay, and the final article for this video is in JAMA. It's another kind of commentary opinion article. Let's see if we can access it. I don't think we're going to be able to. Nope. So we can just see the abstract here. Which offers substantial opportunities to improve patient clinical outcomes, reduce costs, influence population health. I think we we know this already. Yet yeah, we have a lot of data. Complementary role, yeah, it's a big thing. Uh, AI is going to complement humans, not replace them. Although there's a bit of nuance to it. So recent ones have shown high levels of accuracy in imaging and signal detection tasks and considered it among the most mature tools in this domain. Fine, I mean, uh, I'm sure they make some really interesting points in the actual article itself, but we can't access that today. Um, cool. So that was the last three weeks of AI research and interesting papers. Um, what are some of the main takeaways? I mean, we're seeing some of the themes here. We're seeing papers being upgraded, uh, so like risk models, predictive models being up upgraded using machine learning. So we have existing models, typically logistic regression, at least the ones that we've seen have been logistic regressions, and they're then being upgraded by using machine learning and using different approaches like gradient boosted trees. We are also seeing certain types of uh, imaging modalities crop up continuously. So retinal scans, retinal photographs, um, are very common themes. We saw several papers on those, and also breast scans, so mammographies, uh, also come up, coming up again a lot. And I think one of the reasons for that is because those are commonly used in screening. So we have large, large data sets because most women over a particular age will be having these breast screenings. And one of the key things for these models is that you need that data going forward to train these models. And there's also a lot of interesting ways that they can then be incorporated once you develop these models. If you have something that's used as a screening test, maybe that can be used uh, to support that screening. Maybe you can increase access in third world. Maybe you can um, just make that process more efficient. So for example, there was a recent Google Health paper which looked at breast cancer screening and they compared the performance of their model uh, with humans if you had it as the first screener or as the second screener. So the way that the breast scans mammograms are usually processed is you will have a first reviewer who kind of reviews it to see if there's any abnormalities and it will then be reviewed by a second radiologist and once, if they both review the scan and they think that it's positive, then uh, they'll then refer to the next step. And in that Google Health paper, um, which I'll also link in the description, and they found that the model works very effectively as a second screener. So maybe the way that this could be used is you have somebody reviewing the first step, um, like a radiologist reviewing that image to begin with, and then as the second screener, you would have this AI model. Um, and in combination, that could work very well. It could perform slightly better than two humans. And obviously it reduces the number of humans you need. So it makes it a bit more efficient um, in terms of people hours used in order to do this. Uh, so that's something that's interesting. And then we saw in quite a few of the viewpoints, some common themes mentioned as well. Things like AI explainability, things like prospective clinical validation of studies, making sure that you're reporting things appropriately and scientifically and also then showing that that can be generalizable. So those are the main takeaways that I got from, from reading through those papers. I hope that was somewhat interesting. If you'd be interested in, in reading those papers, uh, definitely check out Dr. Penguin and go through the articles that I've mentioned today and read them in a bit more detail uh, if you have access to the articles. And a big shout out to the team behind Dr. Penguin, Pranav Rajpakur and Eric Topol and the other people working in the team. It's a really great initiative. I'm a big fan of it. I read it every week, or at least I, I sometimes work back through issues as you can see. But yeah, thank you so much for putting that together every week. And if this was something you found interesting and you have any particular comments or thoughts or suggestions for improvement, leave a comment in the description below. Uh, this is still fairly experimental. I just had this idea yesterday. Let me know what you think. Uh, I probably will just keep on doing these anyway because to be honest, 
I was going to be reading the papers anyway, so actually uh, there's not much extra effort in putting a camera on and recording for it. But yeah, that's everything for today. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one.